thanks for tuning in to Telecast. Before you listen to the show, I wanted to let you know about our next content industry event, the Telecast Digital Content Forum, sponsored by BBC Studios. It takes place at BFI Southbank in London on the 10th of November. The first event of its kind in the UK, it will create an environment for producers, podcasters, brands, media agencies, platforms and the wider content industry to gather, learn, debate and share insight on the business opportunities in the fast developing world of digital first content. Panel sessions during the day are designed to provide actionable insights and will focus on production, development, community building, IP, formats and brand funded social content. Speakers include senior execs from Meta, BBC Studios, Lab Bible Group, Channel 4, Future Studios, Audio Boom, The Sidemen, Jungle Creations, and more to be announced. The lineup also features top creators, including YouTube star Joe Sugg and Danny Robbins, creator of podcast turned TV series The Battersea Poltergeist. And our moderators include Creativeville Sam Barcroft and former YouTube Originals Commissioner and Executive Producer Luke Hyams. Tickets are strictly limited and only available at telecast.com forward slash events. Telecast listeners can also get an extra £20 off the ticket price by using the promo code Telecast Plus. We'll see you there. Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to another Telecast. My guests this week are BBC Studios' Helen Pendlebury, Lab Bible's Tom Gulsevin, and in the last of our MIPCOM interviews, I catch up with legendary TV's Anne Tomopoulos. As we talk, the BBC is 100, changes in the digital content space, and Legendary's new drama based on a hit manga series. They're all coming up on this week's Telecast. My first guest on this week's show is Tom Gulsevin, Director of Creative Strategy at Lad Bible Group. Hi, Tom. Welcome to Telecast. Hi, Justin. Thanks for having me. Not at all. Great to have you on the show. Always interested to hear what's going on at Lad Bible Group. Lots to talk about at the moment in the digital content space. But before we do so, can you give us a bit, little bit of background on your career so far and your role at Lad Bible and what you know what you do? Wow, well, um, where to start? I mean, before I was involved in any kind of TV stuff, I used to work uh, writing content for the internet, as old as that sounds, as a concept <laughs> for all the portals like Microsoft, Yahoo, AOL, and all of those kind of guys, which um, I mean, was fun. But I was lucky enough to be around when all of those platforms started really prioritizing short form video uh, over written content and saw the kind of pretty speedy transition from everyone writing quizzes and making galleries to picking up cameras and recording videos. So uh, that was kind of my introduction into, I guess, this digital video and then latterly uh, TV where I joined E4 as the digital producer there and worked on all the kind of older E4 shows that people might remember like Skins and Inbetweeners and Misfits as the the internet person, the person whose job it was I guess to make those shows and brands broader than the half hour or hour that played out in the rectangle in the corner of the room, right? How did they become things that existed across social media and across games and across online videos, as well as the show that you come back for every week? So you say you came from a sort of a more text-based, you know, content you know, direction in your career. Can you remember what was the first video that you produced as a digital video? Well, I really can't remember what the the first one might have been, Justin, but I'll tell you one that really sticks in my head because um, I felt incredibly lucky to do it at the time. It was, a time, I guess, a time which like video was finding it, so a short form video was in its like relative infancy on those platforms, but also branded content and branded videos. And I remember doing a campaign 
with Team GB around basically climate change and their kind of green credentials. And as a huge fan of cycling, having the opportunity to do a video with Victoria Pendleton, but that being the first thing I, I made, uh, one of the first things I made for, for Microsoft and being in part sort of starstruck, but also like buzzing that that was my job <laughs> to hang out with mm. uh, one of the best cyclists in the country and make a video about cycling. And uh, But yeah, very cool. Well, that's a great thing about working in content, isn't it? Sometimes you get to work with somebody that you idolise or you're just a big fan of or or just generally you find really interesting. And uh, that's uh, you know something that I, I love about working in this business. So I, I imagine you were at Channel 4 right at the beginning of Channel 4's real focus on digital. How did that you know come about and what was the sort of focus while you were there at Channel 4? So, lots of really exciting digital it has had various names in our industry over the years i think it was called new media at the time when i first joined then latterly online and then digital but there was always already lots of brilliant innovative digital work happening when i joined uh, the focus of that time was very much uh, and i'm sure lots of your listeners will remember it were the kind of the focus on second screening and sort of companion apps, companion experiences to the thing that you were watching on TV. So everything from like the million pound drop app, that was one of the things that was kind of happening when I joined to big multi-platform shows. That's another term that that sort of sits with that era, multi-platform, like first dates that started as like people might remember that started as a big uh, multi-platform project. And yeah, like that, that kind of era of real, I guess, experimentation and innovation in the digital TV space, which I guess like it was a really brilliant time to try things out, but also a time which I think we did loads of stuff that amazing award-winning work that sort of evolved over time to be a bit more focused on how can people with uh, digital experience help get viewers towards shows but also how can they make content that people will just enjoy on digital platforms and maybe isn't as tied to the show that that you see on the TV every week is just good content in its own right. So I sort of saw that evolve a little bit over time. I guess one one of my like the biggest turning points for me was uh, when E4 commissioned Made in Chelsea. That sort of represented a brilliant opportunity in hindsight looking back to make a brand that wasn't just the reality show that went out on E4 but was a a YouTube channel as well and a spin-off series that lived on well 4OD at the time all four now that was really kind of focused I guess in building an audience that watched more VOD hence more content on Channel 4's VOD platform but also an audience that we could grow on another platform in the form of YouTube by playing the games that other people on YouTube were playing, making content that looked like it was at home on YouTube. We did everything from like YouTube parodies of what Made in Chelsea was to live watch-alongs and vlogs and reaction videos, everything you'd expect to find on a YouTube channel, but in the world of Made in Chelsea. That, I guess, was a really exciting shift for me where we went from innovative experiments to let's build an audience and make content they just genuinely watch want to watch on the platforms that they're watching them presumably that was mainly youtube back in back in the day he says it wasn't too long ago but now obviously we're seeing so many other platforms that have uh, developed over the years and which have a requirement for original content designed specifically for that platform rather than just editing a show a short you know into short form and bunging it on every different platform and expecting to work there's a real skill set that digital producers now are developing around the particular requirements of each different platform and that's something that you're doing at lad bible aren't you yeah i mean it's absolutely huge it's one of the things that predicates like loads of our development and the formats that we make and love that they need to work everywhere our audience are right we are a very audience first producer uh, rather than a kind of platform first producer that makes for the platforms i like to think that we make our content for the audience and then we publish on the platforms where the audience are i guess in the past that might have looked a bit more like 
clips effectively like taking the thing that is the longest version of that bit of content and clipping it appropriately for each of the platforms and hoping they sort of find their feet on those platforms and find a few eyeballs at the same time but increasingly particularly where i am at at lad studios our strategy is develop the idea and then develop all the iterations and versions of that idea for every single platform we think it might go which is really exciting. You know, it, it genuinely feels like what we have at the heart of lots of our development is a really brilliant concept. And then loads of experts around Lad Studios who know the platforms inside out and know what the audiences do and how they react to things that can then say, this is the version of that idea we need for this platform. This is the version of the idea we need for that platform and this format and this way that people consume content. How does that work as a workflow? Though, yeah. Tom, you know, because if you're producing a show for, let's say, four different platforms, maybe Snap, TikTok, YouTube, and Insta, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. How does yeah. that actually work? So you've got a great idea. It might be with some talent that you've got in the studio, or it might just be an interview format, whatever. That. How does that work in practice? It sounds like an incredible amount of work to have different versions of, of a show, even though it is short form, for each different platform. How does that work? It, on paper, could look like an awful lot of work. I think what we've done as Lad Studios uh, over the last couple of years is really refine some workflows to make it completely intuitive and work perfectly for the the teams working on it. I'll give it, it's probably best explained an example. One of our formats, Confessions, which is an idea born of, I guess, uh, seeing lots of Fox Pops be very popular again on lots of platforms and, you know, hearing what real people are saying on the street. Confessions is that taken, well, as the name suggests, of people's biggest confessions. We stop people on the street and they have the opportunity to either anonymously or in plain sight tell us some of their, their biggest secrets. When we made that idea, we were really conscious that we needed that to work in different ways on every single platform that it was going to go out. So when we shot for YouTube, that was a very, I describe it in the context of what we do, premium shoot, right? Three cameras, very glossy lenses, big graphics package, uh, long extended cuts of people telling their stories and their confessions looked brilliant for YouTube and worked perfectly for there, but we knew wasn't what people would expect to see or necessarily wanted to see on short form platforms like TikTok or Insta Reels. Uh, so at the same time as shooting that very glossy premium version of the, the show, our originals team also sh- took an iPhone and a little rig for the iPhone as well and shot the same contributors uh, telling the same stories on an iPhone, vertical video, in a way that felt more lo-fi but loads more appropriate to short form platforms that really prioritize that kind of shooting style so it was more work but more work that has really paid off in terms of the success of each version of that show i think being much greater because of the appropriateness of the, the shooting style and the production style for for that bit of content and we knew like for snapchat for example that's a platform, again, vertical video, but also that, that really values the authenticity of something that feels a bit more lo-fi, but requires those videos to be a bit more like five to six minutes. So a kind of middle ground between the YouTube version, compiled longer form stories, and the short form version, a bit more lo-fi uh, production style, is what we ended up publishing on Snapchat. So real like tweaks and nuances to the production style that have really helped push that format in different ways on different platforms, I guess. It's obviously appropriate when, when, when you're testing and learning, and that's one of the things in digital video. You uh, you mentioned earlier on of what you did at, at Channel 4 was the opportunity to do that. And that, I know that's something that you do now, you know, with even with new formats, new shows yeah. at, at Lab Bubble. But getting to this point now where you're perfecting you know a different show for a different platform at the heart of this though in digital video is authenticity isn't it i'm middle-aged guy i'm trying to try and working out what my what my kids are really find interesting on uh on social platforms but is it that you know the striving for the authenticity which is driving the popularity of social platforms oh absolutely i mean us as publishers and producers 
you're completely right that's that's what really underpins that mentality of making things appropriately for every platform like authenticity is one of those words i guess knocked around so much these days by people making content that it itself probably sounds quite inauthentic these days just to say mm. that bit of content is authentic <laughs> but the thing that i guess is um yeah that, that it means to me is is making content that feels like it's at home on the news feed of the person watching it on the platform right it often absolutely sticks out like a sore thumb to me if i'm myself looking at tiktok and i see a bit of content that is really glossy and shot in a totally different way that doesn't feel native to the platform i just sort of half assume it's an ad and that it's gonna try and sell me something at some point so like if it doesn't feel authentic to the platform i sort of discount it mentally so it's really important to us that regardless of what we're making it feels quote unquote authentic to the experience that people are having on that platform at any given time so that they engage with it properly. You know, in terms of Lad Bible, I mean we we know the success of, of the company, but just you know, just for those people who are perhaps not aware of how successful Lad Studios and Lad Bible content is internationally. I know you're you're a very big publisher on Facebook and TikTok, aren't you? Can you give us a an idea of the number of shows and formats that you have and, you know, the the popularity of, of the content that you're producing? I guess the first thing to explain is Lad Studios, in particular, is the production arm of Lad Bible Group, the wider company. Now, we make things for the publisher brands that everyone knows, Lab Bible, Unilad, Tyler, all the kind of verticals underneath those brands as well. Uh, but we also make things for brands with our branded content team and increasingly making things for partners as well, where we're basically producing things for other people's platforms and they're leveraging our expertise. So we are at the heart of it, a production company that services the Lab Bible group. We've got a YouTube channel that is home to all of our original content loads of different formats um too many to sort of list off uh, at the moment but that we publish regularly that's home to lots of our celebrity content where we use the opportunities we get for a really a-list hollywood talent to, to make some of our formats we've got uh, a new video with the rock that's just gone live uh, go and have a look at that that's really funny and that team's run by ben pal jones our creative director making all of our original content over there we've got a portfolio now of 14 different snap shows that live on snapchat uh, as the name suggests variety of different types of shows lots of kind of brilliant mini factual pieces car show no filter uh, some kind of access doc uh, pieces some entertainment shows some reaction formats loads of really exciting stuff happening on snap and then all of our facebook output as well as you mentioned and increasingly our short form output too across tiktok and reels uh, so loads of loads of stuff going on in in 2021 i think we published around 17,000 videos uh, to give you an idea of the the scale of our output I mean, that's going to be, we haven't done the maths yet, uh, but as we get towards the end of 2022, that's going to be significantly more. Now we've kind of, uh, like everyone else, pivoted to also be making things that are more short form for TikTok and, and Reels too, uh, and increasingly YouTube Shorts and uh, Facebook Reels too. So that number's going to be way higher, but that all comes through the, um, the Lad Studios team. Now, we've got a monthly reach of, a billion, I think, is the the latest count. But when you get to those kind of numbers, are just sort of mind boggling, right? Yeah. <laughs> How many people um, our content's reaching across uh, loads of different platforms? But also, as a producer and as someone who's sort of involved in the making that content, so exciting because we just know we've got the opportunity to get that stuff in front of everyone, really. Well, I don't envy the person that's going to have the job at the end of this year to total up all the videos that you've done in 2022. <laughs> but there yeah. we are. That's uh, you know, that's uh, that's somebody's. Uh, Christmas Eve job. Uh, you, you mentioned YouTube Shorts. Now, obviously, this is something that they've pivoted yeah. towards super short form content uh, on the back of Reels and, and a lot of these other platforms, TikTok and Snapchat's success. How do you see things changing in that area? I mean, if you're producing something, for example, for YouTube Shorts, is that going to be fundamentally <laughs> different to the other short form platforms now is there is there a great deal of difference in specifically what youtube shorts is is looking for 
Potentially, I think we're still in a testing phase, basically, Justin, with uh, lots of the short form content. I can imagine there will be nuances. One of the things I'm really excited about with YouTube Shorts in particular is if you look at the app, the proximity of that subscribe button to what you're actually watching and how YouTube Shorts might be in itself a brilliant platform for watching the content we make. And as I was saying before, like appropriately making YouTube Shorts to sit on YouTube, but with that subscribe button being so prominent on the app, how do we use that as a brilliant shop window to the longer form content we're doing as well and encouraging people to subscribe to the Lad TV channel via shorts and a, a kind of a medium that's like less of an investment so that could can later go back and watch some of our long form content that is a bit more of a, you know, sit down, lean in half hours worth of content to watch yeah that might help inform what our youtube short strategy looks like over a tiktok or a insta reels uh, strategy all of them i'm sure will have nuances but i think the exciting thing for me is when i was making quote unquote short form years ago that was like five to ten minutes now short form is obviously less than a minute and getting our head around what that means in a formatted way in a branded way in a really creative way is going to be the exciting bit of work that we continue doing for the rest of this year and do into 2023 it's just that exciting to get your hands on a new platform and a new way of making things yeah you know just thinking of what you were saying earlier on about Snapchat and the more authentic, you know, iPhone mm. shot content really works on that platform. Now, we've seen YouTube become almost like a premium digital platform that's more appropriate for longer form content. Now they're launching shorts or they've launched shorts. Do we think that that's going to maybe become, again, more iPhone short authentic content will work better in the shorts or do we think that's going to be more of the glossy, a shorter form of the glossy content that lives on YouTube? That's a really good point, Justin. I think the thing that's really important is that we're making content that's authentic to the way that people are using that platform and the other content they're seeing there. So whilst the kind of iPhone shot lo-fi style, I think is completely right. And I, I'm sort of saying this knowing we need to test more, but um, I think that's completely right for TikTok because that's a lot of what I see on TikTok and it's completely right for Reels. Again, that's a lot of what I see my friends and family creating and other creators creating on those platforms. My experience of YouTube Shorts so far has been a lot more premium and it has been, and I accept that everyone's experience of these platforms because the algorithms are very different, but mine has been clips of podcasts, clips of longer form shows, but re-versioned and re-framed to work in that shorts wrapper. So maybe you're completely right. The more premium take on short form might be what YouTube Shorts is pointing itself towards. It's certainly something we're trying. Lots of our original formats that live on YouTube, we're definitely going to be looking at what the short form version of those looks like and, and how that plays out on the platform too. But I'd say like as as with everything that Lad Studios does and Lab Bible does as a as a group, lots of testing and lots of following our noses to what the audience really want. Yeah. No, fascinating. I, I love the uh, you know the way that things are developing and changing all the time in this sector. It's so uh, exciting. You know, your background you, you mentioned you were at Channel Four, you're more of the digital side of Channel Four obviously, but you recently wrote a piece for C twenty one about yeah. broadcasters and digital first studios that can work together more effectively to bridge the gap between social and TV. Because I think it's fairly fair to say that a lot of more traditional linear TV networks have been a little bit reluctant to, you know, to dive into the digital first area uh, for various reasons. Maybe some just don't understand it or maybe not seeing that necessarily the business case for it, but that's, I think, mm. changed over the last few years. Definitely. Tell us a little bit about your thinking on that in, uh, you know, how broadcasters and digital first studios can reinvent TV. Yeah, I mean, it's something that's really close to heart, particularly from I guess a PSB perspective and absolutely sort of like lots of people in our industry and, and lots of your listeners are really loving the, the PSBs in the UK and their remit, really thinking about how they, they can work with some of the publishers and producers that have really cracked finding digital audiences and, and how those digital audiences work. So it's, it's a bit of thing that, that I've been really passionate about for a while, actually, like how those two worlds can work more closely together, uh, which is why I put that article together in the first place. I think the biggest thing for me, and one of the biggest learnings that I've had since joining LAD 
it's really the commitment that's required long term to to make a, a digital play work and really encouraging those broadcasters uh, to think about the long term for those digital plans. You know, we enter into lots of our development hoping that our ideas will land and we end up doing 100 episodes of that idea minutes with which is our kind of the beating heart of our youtube channel an idea of which we're very proud that our originals team make is just topped 120 episodes i think i think episode 121 with brian cox went live this week so that's a real like commitment to something that's gone out every week for 121 weeks now right and i think like the broadcasters getting to grips with that level of longevity and commitment long term to digital plays is going to be really, really important to make that kind of thinking work. I'd love to see um, more partnerships between the broadcasters and brands like Lab Bible and Lab Studios, but other digital producers as well that really understand the world that we operate in to really make those kind of plays work and treat it more as a partnership than, than as a commission. And you're talking about other social publishers and producers. Now, you're joining us as a panellist on the Social Publishers, the new TV networks panel at yeah. the Telecast Digital Content Forum, sponsored by BBC Studios. So I'm really excited about that. And thank you for agreeing to come on the panel, Tom. Now, we've got Joe Sugg, who's on that panel, and execs from Wall of Entertainment, Jungle Creations, Jordan, who's the manager of the Sidemen, and... It's moderated by Sam Barcroft. So it's going to be a really interesting discussion between, you know, leaders in the social publishing space. And I can't wait for that, actually. So thank you for coming on. Same. Thank you very much for having me. It's such an exciting event and such an exciting topic as well. I think it's really interesting because obviously there are there are plenty of parallels between how like the Lab Bible Network or Wall of Comedies Network or even a kind of creator network like Sidemen operate and the broadcasters uh, operate, but also a ton of differences. So, yeah, it's going to be a really interesting one to, to discuss. Yeah, a lot of learnings, hopefully. That's the idea of the event. Looking forward to seeing you there. And now it's time for Tom's Story of the Week, the content industry news that's caught Tom's eye in the past seven days. What's your story of the week, Tom? So the new story I've chosen, Justin, is the quote unquote slowing down of digital advertising that we've been hearing lots about over the last week with um, Snap first, I think, then Meta, then Alphabet, Google and YouTube all announcing tough Q freeze and the deceleration of their growth. But I guess the wider topic being that deceleration of yeah, digital advertising, be it video or otherwise. I read an article in the Financial Times over the weekend which was really Playing the blame game, I guess, as to why all of this has happened, everything from the sort of macroeconomics of it and and the war uh, that slowed down spend and the wider economic situation, all the way through to growth of new competitors like TikTok. And that's all fine and brilliant uh, conjecture and interesting. But the thing that is more interesting to me and the thing that I've been thinking a lot about uh, over the last week in, in light of that news is what that change means to us as producers and the people who make things for those platforms. I guess the, what it comes back, back to, to me, as I was saying earlier, is when platforms have a, a tougher quarter, it's even more strategically important for us as producers and us as lad studios to think about how our content and the content that we make goes everywhere and how we can distribute the content that we're investing in and the ideas that we like on every single platform that we've got. As I was saying earlier, being platform agnostic and audience first is ever more important for us and making sure that when we have a brilliant idea and develop a brilliant format we love, we could just maximise the way we distribute it on everyone's platform, not be necessarily too reliant on any one platform that might be having a tough quarter and growing slightly less yeah and um, we, i mean we've seen lots of change and development obviously in this relatively new sector and we've seen a lot of original content commissioning falling off from youtube and snap recently said they weren't going to commission any other original content and similar with meta i think uh, other than sort of special projects or such but and we also see lots of algorithm changes that can fundamentally affect 
a publisher, a producer on on the network as well. Mm. That must be uh, a bit unnerving when you wake up to find YouTube's changed the algorithm and and you're not getting the plays and the clicks that you were uh, 24 hours ago. It's again, I suppose it's about mitigating that. It's about being on as many platforms as you can, right? Hundred percent. I think it it absolutely can be unnerving, but. As you say, Justin, the digital content industry has always been an industry that's been born of change, I suppose. Like, um, it's constantly changing. So I think, well, me personally, but I know everyone who I work with at Labby as well, we're kind of used to the change and thrive on the change. It's it's a brilliant machine at Labby to watch when there is an algorithm change. Everyone learn the algorithm again and get to know what it is that's been tweaked and what we need to do with our content to help the algorithm learn what we're publishing and get in front of people that would like to see the formats that we're making you know it's it's really exciting in that respect how does that actually work tom i mean have you got a hotline into youtube to say you know guys what have you changed what do we need to do or is it a case of you know you've got to look at what they're doing and, and test different things and work out because I think they give a few clues, don't you? Around SEO, I've seen that, you know, around search engine optimization, when they change algorithms at Google, you do get some sort of ideas of what they're trying to reward and what they're trying to, you know, suppress on the platform. I'd say it's a real combination, Justin. Like we have brilliant relationships with the platforms and speak regularly with our partner managers and the platform experts there uh, about what they're doing or about what they're seeing, but conversely about what we're seeing as well and any trends that we're noticing in our content. But I'd say it's a combination of that, but also us just being really ready and agile enough to test lots. So I'm closest to Snapchat more than any other platform in terms of the content we make. And just when you think there is a trend or a particular piece of content that people are enjoying and you sort of lean into that trend, that will change and that something totally different will be doing well. And it's sort of the joy of experimenting and finding out what that next thing is going to be to keep people engaged. That is one of the things that I think keeps everyone excited. At yeah. That. And that's, that's not just about algorithm. It's also content, isn't it? It's like, what's going well? What's going well? How can we react? How can we jump on this wave and identify something that's growing and growing and make our own version of it, if you like? A hundred percent. Those things sort of work really beautifully in tandem, don't they? There's the algorithm changes, but also it's humans at the other end of that algorithm watching the content and if they don't find a particular thing interesting anymore or they've like sort of moved on to a different trend we've also got to be aware of that but there's the the kind of human element of that too of keeping our audience entertained with the stuff that they really want to see i guess and now it's time for hero of the week and we also get to find out what tom's chucking in the bin tom who's your hero of the week I've taken a slight cough out, Justin, and not chosen a particular Hero of the Week. We're today, we're recording on 31st, which is Halloween, and in hearing my children downstairs readying their costumes and getting ready to go uh, out trick-or-treating, well, I've chosen this week to hero scary stuff. It's a bit of my um, sort of guilty pleasure about horror and all things spooky and content is some of my favourite genres. So, um, so that's what I'm hearing. I'm, in particular, I've been watching... The Watcher on Netflix over the last couple of days in preparation for for Halloween, which is like a a psychological horror thriller miniseries, which is in equal parts like silly and sus- suspenseful. For anyone that likes the genre, I do recommend it. But it is that that level of kind of horror sin- silly. I totally love it. That's what I've been enjoying this week. All kind of things speaking. All right, okay, okay, Tom. I'm going to put you on the spot now. Best horror movie of all time. Uh, I mean, in terms of real classics, I mean, this is a dark thing to discuss on your podcast, uh, Justin, but Texas Chainsaw Massacre is one of those classics that I could go back to all the time. And uh, I mean, Ben, Pal James at Lab were discussing the other day. I'm sure loads of your listeners will remember it, but Ghost Watch, the old BBC uh, one-off special, is something that I re-watch all the time because I remember it from my childhood. But like, I just love the folklore of. I just love kind of modern mythology and folklore around that kind of thing. So somewhere between Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Ghost Watch, how about that? Right, right. Okay, well, actually, uh, I did see Quentin Tarantino on uh, one of the US chat shows talking about that was almost the perfect movie, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But we'll uh, <laughs> move on move on quickly from that. And uh, who or what's going in the bin this week, Tom? So, so probably 
slightly unsurprisingly, who I've chosen Kanye, Kanye West to go in a bin, very obviously for uh, the comments he's made, uh, a kind of a reminder that the anti-Semitic comments that he made have at no place anywhere, let alone on the social media platforms that he made them. Uh, but also a, a bit of a reminder for me, again, thinking as a producer about like the platforms that we give to talent sometimes and creatively invest in their ideas are on relatively shaky ground. Now, I know Kanye is a really extreme example of this, right? But the fallout of those comments leading to his documentary being shelved, CAA dropping him, Adidas dropping him eventually after a couple of days, Balenciaga, the gap, the list goes on of people that sort of distance themselves from Kanye West after he made those comments is a real reminder of how careful, I guess, we need to be when we choose the talent that we work with and sign them up to the projects that we put them in and how fragile that can be. Yeah, no, that's true. It's sometimes, it's it's a fine line between working with talent who are who have become famous because of, you know, perhaps being edgy or uh, but it's it's also be careful what you wish for right when you when you're giving people a platform and quite right i think everybody would expect uh, kanye to be going in the bin this week oh. tom thank you so much for coming on the show really enjoyed our chat best of luck with everything at lad bible cheers justin thanks very much for having me my next guest on this week's telecast is helen pendlebury director of digital and business development at BBC Studios Productions. Welcome to the show, Alan. How are you doing? Hi, Justin. Um, I'm doing well. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me along. It's really, I've really enjoyed listening to this podcast over the years, so I'm really delighted to be part of it. Great. Over the years, that's right. You're making me feel quite, uh, <laughs> quite. But we're on 122 wow. now. We're well into triple figures. Oh. And this is the first time we've had anybody from BBC Studios on the show, which is uh, fantastic. I've always wanted to speak to somebody from the veritable organisation. Tell us a little bit about your background then and, and your role. And uh, first of all, give us a bit of a, a career overview, Helen, how you got to your position at BBC Studios Productions. OK, well, I started out, like many people do, doing work experience. I did a media degree at Goldsmiths College and then I just wrote off and applied to, to get experience wherever I could. My real aim, because my real passion is music, was always to work for Radio 1. But that yeah, I had to take a convoluted route to get there. And so initially, I wrote to TV companies. So my first work experience after uni was for Planet 24, working on The Big Breakfast and The Word. And then I got further work experience at MTV. And from there, I got offered a job as the assistant to the head of music programming at MTV. So I started in music, really in television. And from being an assistant, I became a music programmer. And I was there for three years. And then I applied for a job at Top of the Pops, running right. their websites. Ah, that's really interesting. So you've got a, a, you know, a real music TV deep experience there. And what sort of music were you programming? You say you were a music programmer at uh, MTV. What, what, uh, was it particular shows or was it right across the channel? Well, when I first joined, MTV only had one channel across Europe at the time. So it was the start of them regionalising and launching new channels. So initially I was programming late night specialist music shows. So the, the first show I ever programmed was called The Chill Out Zone. Um, and it ran in the middle of the night on a Saturday night. And it was really just kind of like ambient house and experimental music, particularly with great creative videos. And then I started doing dance shows and indie shows. Headbangers ball? Did you do headbangers ball? <laughs> I didn't do ball? headbangers. I was not a specialist in metal, but I sat next to the people who did. But yeah, it was it was a really exciting time being fresh out of uni to kind of work on you know, such a, a big brand and be able to kind of immerse myself in music. So, yeah, went to Top of the Pops. And th that's when I moved into digital, actually. I applied to work on the website for Top of the Pops. And this was in the late 90s, not wanting to age myself, but um, really early days of, of digital. But that's where I kind of learned how to code a website and, you know, really got into working on trying to engage audiences around programs on digital platforms and it's from there that I eventually got to Radio 1 because I moved from Top of the Pops website to running the Radio 1 website that was just great I got to work with some brilliant DJs 
John Peel, Giles Peterson, mm. you know, Zane Lowe. It was a really exciting time to be there because I think it was, you know, a station that, as does still, you know, had a great mix of pop, you know, and daytime presenters as well as specialist music presenters. I really focused on specialist music there. But, um, yeah, I ran the interactive department at Radio 1, and then I progressed to do the same at Radio 2 and 6 Music. Right. So, yeah, quite a big radio background for a few years. I, I also went to work for Bauer Radio after I'd left BBC. And then I moved back into television, and still in digital, but I went to run the digital team at ITV Daytime. That's really interesting background because you know, you've know you seen digital disruption and how that's changed the music industry beyond all recognition, really, in the last 20 years. Particularly, obviously, we saw, you know, Top of the Pops became a show that, you know, that, that wasn't necessarily sustainable anymore, the way that that YouTube has, uh, has, you know, completely changed, Spotify, all the different digital downloads, the way that that's affected music and obviously affected media and TV as well. So it's a, that's a really interesting way that you've come through, skirted music and TV all the way through your career. Yes, it's interesting sometimes listening to Radio 6 Music and hearing them mention the short-form text code 64046 because I actually set that up originally and that was one of the early forms of interactivity back on Six Music back in the day because it was before social media existed you know Mm. and so you either emailed or text the station Um, so I I always get a little cheeky thrill when I hear that text code (laughs) (laughs) knowing that I came up with that number. I've been really privileged to work across loads of great brands you know, really high profile media brands and be able to kind of work on engaging with audiences in different ways as technology develops. And it's something that I still do at BBC. And, you know, I'm privileged here to work across such great outputs such as Strictly, Top Gear, Later with Jewels, Dragon's Den, you know, our Glastonbury coverage, Eurovision. You know, the range of output that BBC Studios produces is pretty phenomenal and me and my team are really here to help ensure that we are engaging with our audiences on digital platforms and also developing you know our shows innovatively so that we can keep evolving them as technology evolves. So you joined BBC Studios from ITV Daytime is that is that right? Well, I did, but I actually joined in Australia. I moved to Australia for five years after working in ITV. And so I worked at BBC Worldwide, as was in Australia, looking after local format productions. So local versions of Strictly, which was Dancing with the Stars over there in both Australia and New Zealand. Um, And also I launched The Great Australian Bake Off. And I also worked on our live events in Australia. So... I was really privileged to tour people such as Sir David Attenborough, Brian Cox, Louis Theroux around Australia doing in-conversation events and also looked after huge events such as Top Gear Festival and the Doctor Who Festival as well. Um, And I launched the first ever international season of BBC Proms in Melbourne as well um, when I was there. So. Yeah, five years in Australia, and then I moved back to London and took up the role here. What a great gig. I tell you, working with, with all of those brands and iconic celebrities, and uh, that's, you know, that sounds a, a fantastic experience. So tell us about the digital division then. You're talking about developing projects that are going to help a new generation engage with BBC Studios brands. Give us an idea of the, the size of the digital division and the structure of it. We've got quite a matrix structure, I think, in BBC Studios. So m- myself and my team work for Ralph Lee, who's the CEO of Studios Productions. We are the commercial production arm of the BBC. And Studios Productions is divided into four different content production divisions. We've got our scripted division under Mark Lindsay, which covers comedy and drama. But we also own or have stakes in a number of independent drama production companies, such as Lookout Points, the makers of Happy Valley and Gentleman Jack, 
and Sid Gentle, the makers of Killing Eve. So we've, we've got a number of different independent production partnerships. We have a factual division under incoming MD Kate Ward, and that has four separate departments within Factual. So we have the Natural History Unit, the Documentary Unit, the Science Unit, and a Factual Podcast Unit. We have a Kids and Family Division under Cecilia Person. We launched this division in April this year, um, and so we're growing brilliant children's brands such as Bluey and Hey Dougie within that department. We have our International Production and Formats Division, which is divided into three different departments. We have our Factual Entertainment and Events Division under Hannah Wyatt. So that department looks after programmes such as Top Gear and Dragon's Den, and also our ceremonial events such as the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. We have our Entertainment and Music Division under Susie Lamb. Susie looks after brilliant programmes such as Strictly, Later with Jules, and our annual Glastonbury coverage and we have an international production and formats division under Matt Ford and that department really looks after two things one is developing and distributing global formats and the other is looking after our international production bases so we have production setups in countries such as the states big division in LA we've got production bases in Australia, where I used to work, um, in Mumbai, uh, and all around Europe and in Africa as well. So that's the setup of Studios Productions. And my team sits at the centre working across all of those different divisions. And we, we look after three key areas. Digital content, which particularly focuses on programme support around our shows across social media, and also producing original content for social platforms. We look after audio content, so podcasting and radio production. And we also have a branded entertainment department, which focuses on both ad-funded programming for TV and also digital content as well. So that, that's the setup of Studios Productions overall, but we also work in collaboration with other departments across BBC Studios. So we have our digital consumer engagement departments, And that is led by Athena Witter, who oversees content programming for that department. That department really focuses on our global social platforms, such as our BBC Earth channels or our Top Gear channels. And that department is tasked with growing commercial revenues across our social platforms. We also have a FAST team looking after our growing portfolio of FAST channels. That's run by Beth Anderson in the States. And we also have a big team looking after BBC.com as well, which comes under our news department. So we're quite a large convoluted setup, but I think that we all work together really effectively to you know, drive the growth of digital content across BBC Studios. And you mentioned there's lots of independent production companies under the BBC Studios umbrella. I'm assuming Baby Cow is one of those. And yes. But I had to say because I'm a huge Alan Partridge fan and, and I <laughs> see the work that your team does on the social channels, the, the Partridge social channels, which, are, which is fantastic, yeah. I have to say. And you've made a recent investment, haven't you, into, into Joe Sugg's uh, production business? Yes, we've done a development partnership deal with Final Straw Productions, which is Joe's new company. The reason behind that deal was really to kind of work with Joe on developing entertainment and factual entertainment formats for audiences of all ages. He's a brilliant creative. Obviously, he started as a social producer, but he's really built his brand over the past few years. You'll have seen him on Strictly. He was runner up there in 2018. He now hosts the Strictly official podcast. But I actually worked with Joe back in 2015 when we first started talking to him about potentially partnering with BBC Studios. I was in Australia at the time and we brought him and his social partner Casper Lee out to do a tour of Australia. So we knew that he had a brilliant fan base and we we knew that he was really big in Australia. So we, we put on some ticket in events and to be honest with you it was phenomenal it was like touring one direction around Australia tickets flew out of the door within seconds of going on sale and girls were screaming like mad (laughs) you know so it it was just you know it was it's great to see Joe you know really progress from being social 
a social publisher, which he still is, of course, to really kind of moving into traditional media and television. You know, he's got brilliant ideas and we just saw the opportunity to partner with him to hopefully bring some of those ideas to wider audiences. We've had various other guests in the past, Jordan, for example, who's the manager of the Sidemen, and seeing all of the commercial opportunities that are exploding around creators right now and 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 so you're working with final straw not only about uh, on original programming ideas and formats but are are you working with him on on other commercial opportunities outside pure content creation yeah i think a big part of what bbc studios is focused on is developing ip for exploitation in different forms. So yes, with Joe, we want to create TV programs and digital content, but we also want to look at how we develop IP with him that we can exploit in other ways, whether it's publishing, whether it's live events, you know, whether it's podcasts or other content opportunities. So certainly it is a big area of focus for us. And one of the reasons that in general, we do audio in BBC studios and podcasting as well is not only to create great radio and podcast output, but also to build IP that we might be able to develop into publishing or into live events or, or of course, TV shows. So one of the podcasts that we're really proud of is the Just One Thing podcast that we do with Dr. Michael Mosley. We do that for BBC Sounds. It's about to go into its fourth series, but we've done a book deal with him and that's just about to be published, actually. And so, you know, it's a great example of where we can work with our TV talent because we've worked with Michael for many years on TV programmes and then actually, you know, develop other forms of content with him that we can grow his brand together. I tell you, Helen, we need to speak. A telecast book deal needs to be on the <laughs> cards. You know, we'll, uh, we'll maybe have a separate side conversation. With your beautiful face on the front cover, of course. <laughs> there we are. Thank you. Now, we, obviously, your digital division is growing. And you mentioned Kate Ward, obviously, from Vice, yes. who's joining you, who's a former guest on uh, on the show. And I've also read in the, the press that you've just hired Kate Norham from Sky. Yes, all the Kates can come and work at studios. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really delighted. Kate started with us this week from Sky. You know, she's come to lead our branded entertainment division. We've had some really good success in the past couple of years making ad funded programs and other forms of digital content for brands. Recent productions such as The Great Home Transformation for IKEA and Channel 4 which we launched earlier in the year. We also have a multi-nominated production that we did for Hellman's called Cook Clever Waste Less, which was a show focused on food waste, but also, you know, an entertaining fact end format, which we again produce with Channel 4 as well. So for us, it's a real growing area. And, and those shows also benefit from being distributed internationally by our sales and distribution division as well. So I think we we feel that we can offer quite a unique solution for brands where we can offer creative opportunities for brands to work with some of our brilliant program makers. So automotive clients can work with the producers of Top Gear, can get access to the producers of some of our best science and natural history content. So we can develop bespoke creative solutions for clients that really hit the mark for what clients want to do in the UK but then we also can distribute that content internationally, either as a format or as a tape sale. So really for us, hiring Kate was really an opportunity for us to really extend and build that area and, you know, bring her brilliant skills and experience into the business. It really does feel like it's uh, brand funded social content or brand funded programming as, as a whole is really started to find its place and, and a little bit of uh, momentum. So this is obviously an area that you're very much investing in. Yes, the reason we got into this area was really that we kept getting approached by brands who wanted to see if there was a way of working with us. We particularly got approaches into our natural history and science units because part of what brands want to do is communicate a message and they wanted to work with some of the best factual program makers in the world. And so out of that, we started to talk more actively with brands and media agencies. And from there, we started to win commissions. And so we recognised the opportunity to match our creative 
producers with with brands and co- develop ideas that would really land what brands wanted to achieve whilst also hitting the sweet spot for what we had expertise in being able to deliver so you know with our factual entertainment division with the makers of Top Gear with the makers of DIY SOS, we make food programs. So to be able to work with automotive clients, uh, create lifestyle content for homes and interiors clients, work with FMCG and food brands, and also, you know, with our science division, we are we can target a range of opportunities, whether it's around the natural world, whether it's around technology, whether it's around space or scientific exploration, we've got the opportunity to really develop brand solutions in a range of genres or areas of creative focus and so for us it it just it it grew from there and and I think we were seeing a lot more opportunity as broadcasters more and more lean into this space as well it helps them with content funding but also I think if you know for brands and for broadcasters they know that they can work with us to help be the intermediary to match what a brand wants to do, but make sure it also works really effectively for a broadcaster or platform so that it engages the audience really effectively. Now, you're a headline sponsor for our digital content forum. So thank you for getting involved with that, Helen. It's great to have you on board. Yeah, we're really excited for the event. You, you've got a brilliant lineup. Yeah, it's it, we really have actually. And uh, the feedback that we've had from all the speakers, but also from people that have I've bought tickets and the delegates that are coming along you know they're they're really excited that there's an event now that represents a lot of what's going on within digital first production and distribution and all the areas that we're talking about we're talking about podcasting you touched on earlier on and brand funded social content obviously you're going to be presenting a fireside as part of your involvement with the event tell us a little bit about that just give us a a bit of a a trailer as to what you're going to be presenting there yes well we thought we'd do something a little bit different because we could turn up and talk about all the things that I've just talked about and really showcase what we're doing within our business specifically but actually I think there's such a great lineup of panelists that you know that's where the the interesting conversation around people's business models should happen so we're going to use our fireside chat to talk about the BBC and its centenary and really look at the role that the BBC has played in creative innovation and also in the digital lives of the British public over the past hundred years. So essentially it's myself, it's Athena Witter from our digital consumer engagement team and Robert Sita who looks after the history of the BBC and, and so he's been very busy recently over the past few weeks as we've been marking the centenary just telling the story of the BBC from very various different perspectives and so he's going to dig around in the archives and come come up with some interesting gems that we can share at the event. Interesting so he's like a custodian of the history of the BBC then he's uh he's like a curator. Yeah so we're looking forward to sharing what we dig out of the archive. <laughs> And now it's time for Helen's Story of the Week, the content industry news that's caught Helen's eye in the past seven days. What's your Story of the Week, Helen? Well, my Story of the Week really builds on what we're going to be talking about at the Digital Content Forum, which is the centenary of the BBC. Anyone who's watched the BBC over the past couple of weeks will not have been able to miss how we've been marking the centenary. And I think what we've done is really marked it in appropriate ways for the programs that we've been broadcasting so if you've watched Strictly you will have seen dances celebrating various programs from across our outputs if you've watched the one show you'll have seen that it was rebranded as the 100 show for the past couple of weeks and last week Jules Holland did a special appearance on the show performing theme tunes from various BBC programs from across the years You'll have seen King Charles making an appearance on The Repair Shop. And also Guy Garvey on his sixth music show the other day played music from across the decades and really just celebrated his feelings around the BBC in a way that was really appropriate for his programme. But I think one of the things when there's always a special event or centenary or certain anniversary to mark, one of the things that always happens is that special programming gets scheduled. And I think... 
for me, one of the most exciting things for the centenary was the special Doctor Who episode where the regeneration from Jodie Whittaker into the next Doctor took place. And I think it was really exciting to see that that wasn't actually Shuti Gatwa who'd been announced as the next Doctor, but actually the 14th Doctor regenerated to be David Tennant. And so I think it set up really exciting kind of storylines for when the programme returns next year. But I think one of the things that I really wanted to focus on around the regeneration was the music of the regeneration and the music of Doctor Who, which has always been so striking and so powerful, previously composed by Murray Gold in the most recent years, but in the last couple of series has been composed by Shagun Akinola. And if you've watched the regeneration, and even if you're not interested in Doctor Who, even if you just look at it and listen to the music, you can just see how powerful and how essential that is to really kind of underscoring the action and the drama in the regeneration. So I think for me, that was probably one of the highlights of the centenary of the BBC. Yeah, well, it certainly made the press. David Tennant was a bit of a, uh, you know, it was a face that nobody expected to uh, to see. Yeah, fantastic. Well done keeping it quiet, by the way. <laughs> I know. I know it's very hard with a brand like that because obviously the fans are so hungry for information, but also I think that they respect keeping the secrets because the reveal on air is so much more powerful when it happens if the stories haven't leaked, of course, beforehand. So, yeah, well, that's it. I mean, it's and there's still a place for event TV, isn't there? there Even is. though you're you're focusing on digital and digital exploitation and people choosing what they watch when and how and, and and where but still you know there's some key tv moments that can still work you know as as scheduled tv just as well as sport can absolutely and now it's time for hero of the week and get in the bin helen who's your hero of the week my hero of the week isn't a person but a number of people because i think what i wanted to focus on and as you'll have heard from what I've been talking about music is a big passion of mine and a big theme throughout my career and what I really wanted to focus on was what I consider to be the rude health of live music in the UK and I think one of the heroes of the last week was probably Jarvis Cocker announcing the return of Pulp which has been a big talking point in my social circle. I'm also really excited to see the Arctic Monkeys live performance on Later with Jewels this coming weekend. I think their new album is absolutely stunning, you know, really rich, really full sounding. And once again, you know, really remarkable lyrics from Alex Turner. And I'm also musically excited about going to the new venue that's just recently opened on Tottenham Court Road. The venue is called Here at Altonet on Tottenham Court Road. And for those who went to see gigs at the Astoria in that area back in the day. You know, yes. it's really great to have a new venue back in that area. And so I'm going next week to see Australian band Gang of Youths play there. So I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, right. OK. And I'm guessing anybody that used to go to the Astoria, I mean, I used to go to the Astoria a lot, the Marquee and all of the all the clubs around Soho. The Sticky Floors were a uh, very much a... Uh, part and parcel of that i'm guessing that the new venues these days maybe don't give that same sort of feeling on the soles of your feet maybe a bit more polished marble these days than sticky floors we shall see but i think that was always the part of the charm of going to the astoria it was never the most glamorous of experiences but i thought it always had great sound you know that yeah. venue so um one of the great gigs that i went to see there was most deaf back in the day you know and it was such a phenomenal concert so really looking forward to seeing how this new venue shapes up. Right. How about getting in the bin, Helen? What are you throwing in the bin this week? Well, I've got to say, there's been a lot of great material from James Corden, Kanye and Elon Musk for us to debate over this past week. Um, yes. Although I think all three of those have had enough media coverage. So, Well, Kanye's already gone in the bin th from Tom <laughs> earlier on in the show. So, uh, yeah. So I, I won't focus on that. But what I thought I would mention is... Imminently will be announced that hasn't been announced at the time of recording of this podcast, although maybe by the time it airs, 
is the lineup for I'm a Celebrity. And I was quite intrigued to see that Boy George is rumoured to be going into the jungle. And I think what will be going in the bin from Boy George will definitely be his fabulous outfits and statement hats, because there's no way that he will be able to wear those in the jungle. So I am looking forward to seeing how he fares and how all the other celebrities do, because I think it's always a big moment of personal challenge that format and so unfortunately glamour has to remain yes. <laughs> kind so yes those yeah. those things will be going in the bin i suspect with Boy yeah George. <laughs> yeah away with the away with the amazing hats and on <laughs> on with chomping spiders and uh things i like think that. so yeah helen fantastic thank you for coming on the show really lovely to have a chat with you and i'm looking forward to seeing you and all your colleagues down at the Telecast Digital Content Forum sponsored by BBC Studios. So we'll see you very soon. Thanks, Justin. See you there. So one of the projects that's caught my eye at this market is a really interesting show called Drops of God. And I'm here with Anne Tomopoulos from Legendary TV to tell us a little bit more about it. How are you doing, Anne? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm very well, yeah, I'm very well. We're uh, we're halfway through the market, or just about maybe a bit further than halfway. Everybody's still standing. It looks at, you know, lots of business being done. Uh, tell us about this new project, because what caught my eye about it was it was based upon a manga story. So tell, tell us about this project. Well, it's a project that was brought to us by um, a producer named Klaus Zimmerman, with whom I worked um, several years ago on a project called Borgia. And he found the material, you know, there's a great tradition of graphic novels and bande dessinée in France, and so I think it kind of makes sense that, you know, through culturally his love of that medium, he found this, and it also speaks to the French patrimony and love of wine and culture. So he optioned the material quite a while ago. He found a writer in France, and then when he brought the material to me, it had already been set up at France Television and Hulu Japan. What was interesting to me as somebody who was launching an international television group is that it really covers multiple cultures and territories and languages. And I think while the themes and plot are very universal, the cultural differences within it are fascinating. There's been a real resurgence in manga stories and manga culture overall as a result of the streamers, over, particularly over lockdown, I think. What is it that, that really interested you about this project and got you involved? Um, what interested me is really the, you know, the core of the story, which is about family. So it's, you know, a very specific story that takes place in a, a somewhat rarefied world of wine. But at the end of the day, it really is the story of a father and daughter and their relationship to one another and how they get to know each other through wine and what happens when you can't speak to someone anymore because they've left this earth. So, you know, it really is a very interesting relationship piece, I think, about, you know, opportunities lost and then opportunities gained and, and how we inform, our relationships are informed by our areas of interest and familial ties. Okay, and, and so tell us about the networks that are involved in the project so far. It was commissioned originally by France Television and Hulu Japan, and I think what's interesting about the France Television Commission is that it's very much a premium show and France Television has historically been obviously uh, it's a public broadcaster but I think this piece of material is remarkably sophisticated and um, interesting for their audience it's I it, to me it feels like a bit of a departure um, but I think it's going to be very successful for them I'm very excited to see how it performs and so it's uh, eight hours it's yes. eight, eight, okay and uh, who are the writers then who's, uh, who's written the script on this the writer is um, Cook Dan Trung. And you've had some talent at the market from the series as well, haven't you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. We've got uh, Stanley Weber with us as well as Fleur uh, Geoffrier. Okay. And, uh, and what's been the response? I mean, I know you're going to say great, you know. but um... No, it's, it's actually, it's been very interesting. Um, we were able to distribute some of the episodes previous to coming, so we've had some good response and we're entertaining offers so that's that's nice, it's nice to get that kind of positive response early on, so we'll see what happens. Well it's really good to see, you know, uh, uh, American company involved with a French originated production from a Japanese story, so it's like, you know, truly international Yeah Well, all the best with the project down at the market, lovely to speak to you and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much Well, that's about it for this week's show. 
and I hope you enjoyed it. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in London and Cannes. Until next week, stay safe.